It's Phoebe from The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Guess what? We went shopping at Subculture Corsets. We got some amazing clothes for our vacation. And Dave even got to sport his very cool and handsome looking shirt when we were, did our live podcast at Scares of Cares. They've got great prices. They've got great selection. Sizes 4 through 4X. Steampunk, goth, rockabilly, anything you can imagine. And you know what? Halloween's coming. And they've got anything that you can make work for any kind of costume you might want to be. And don't forget, they have stuff for the guy in your life too. Right, Dave? Yep. He just wears what I tell him to. So check it out, subculturecorsets.com. And if you want a discount, mention The Horror Show with Brian Keene, and you get 10% discount, whether you put it online or if you order in the store. Hope you enjoy. No comment. Sir, what about the ending to The Rising? Mother f- What part of no comment don't you understand? Do you understand this? This interview is over. No comment. The f- Brian Keene was also unavailable for comment. Hi folks, Brian Keene here. Once again, you are listening to the best of The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Um, if you're unsure why you're getting best ofs, go to the thehorrorshowwithbriankeene.com and uh, you can see all the updates there about our network issues. This week's show, uh, a twofer for you. We have from October 15th of 2015, we have Mr. Jeff Strand. And after Jeff from September 18th of 2015, we have Miss Linda Addison. Uh, we also have Dave here to read advertisements to you. That's very exciting, the most important part of the show. So without further ado, here we go. This week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride. Hold tight, don't slide. That'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the psychopath that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Frady Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely psychopath. Uh, or, um, psychopath. Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations, and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the psychopath. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. And my next guest has been called the funniest writer in horror and horror fiction's answer to Douglas Adams. He's the author of 30 books, including Dweller, Wolf Hunt, Disposal, Mandibles, Benjamin's Parasite, Pressure, which we'll get into a little in a little while, A Bad Day for Voodoo, and many others. Um, I am, of course, talking about the one and only Jeff Strand. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here, even though there are eight people in the room staring at us, yeah. judging us the whole time. You roll with an entourage, man. Yeah, or I'm leeching off of your entourage. I brought my entourage of one. <laughs> I don't know who half these people are. They just followed me up here to the room. So. <laughs> well, and Lombardo, but we can't get rid of him. All right, I know... Uh, I read a, an interview with you not too long ago, and, and you listed some of your modern influences as The Onion and Edward Lee, mm -hmm. which I think both are apt. I think both show up in your fiction. But I want to go back in time. I want to go to Little Jeff growing up in Fairbanks, Alaska. And I like to think that somewhere nearby is Little Laird Barron growing up at the same time. But you guys don't know each other yet, but 
maybe you see each other at the toy store or something. But anyway, there's Little Jeff in Alaska. What were your early influences? Going back to Little Jeff in the toy store, it probably would have been actually R.L. Stein, but not the R.L. Stein who did Goosebumps and Fear Street. He actually did a humor magazine called Bananas. Really? Yeah, and it was just this stupid, stupid magazine aimed at kids. You know, they had a character called Phil Fly, and it was just ongoing garbage-eating jokes. <laughs> and it was just that, you know, we loved that magazine. I would get with my friends, and we would make up our own, you know, versions of the magazine. Yeah. So that kind of thing, because I wasn't really into Mad Magazine. This was more kid-friendly. Right. So I was allowed to read Bananas. Yeah. But it was just as goofy and obnoxious. So that, that if I had to pick one specific influence on Little Jeff in the Toy Store, it would have been... R.L. Stein, who, have, as I think, jovial Bob Stein is how he built himself. Have you time. ever met Stein? Have you ever told him about that? No, I've never no. got to meet him. I got to present his Lifetime Achievement Award to a video, <laughs> so I mentioned that connection yeah. in the speech I gave, but I haven't actually got to meet him in person. Before. Yeah. Now, you started writing when, or reading when you were like three years old, I believe. Yes. So how long after that before you like started writing? Your really stories. early on, yeah. just to the point where I can't even remember how far back it goes. But I also, you know, I wanted to be a cartoonist, just obsessively as a kid, wanted to be a cartoonist. And it kind of, by high school, I had realized that I was no longer enjoying the drawing part because I'm terrible at it. Right. But I was still enjoying writing cartoons, which sort of eventually became fiction writing. Okay. But yeah, I've been writing for as far back as I can remember. Yeah. So was were, was your early stuff like like channeling R. L. Stein's comedic writing? I mean, it it tried to. You know, I was writing stuff that wasn't funny that I thought was funny. Yeah. Like, you know, in fifth grade, I was writing this whole series of fantasy short stories, and to me, they were comedy stories. Right. And people really liked them, but people didn't get that they were supposed to be funny. They were just decent fantasy stories so it took a while you know i've always always wanted to write funny stuff but it took a long time to actually hit the point where i was writing funny stuff right just, so it sounds like early on it was it was probably a lot more sci-fi fantasy comic books maybe D D. um there was that you know i my favorite authors were you know judy bloom beverly cleary so right you know stuff that's not necessarily funny funny but lighthearted. Type so, stuff. So when did you but discover horror then? Horror came really late because I was just a coward. And I also, I lived in Alaska where we didn't have access to horror films on late night TV. Right. You know, our CBS and ABC shared a state, or NBC and ABC shared a station. So we didn't, you know, people who had, you know, their horror host, that's how they grew right. to love horror movies. I didn't have that. What did you have? We didn't have anything. They didn't. You didn't even get like the the Saturday afternoon Godzilla movie no, and Doctor have, Who reruns. No, because on you know Saturday afternoon they would be playing the NBC primetime shows that didn't get played at their normal time. Wow. And also, I couldn't handle gore at all. Something like Star Trek II just freaked me out for <laughs> weeks. You know, the leech alien yeah. thing. So I was way too squeamish. So I wasn't really much of a horror fan until high school and I just fell in with the wrong crowd the people who watched horror movies yeah so do you remember what your first your the first one that really had an impact on you was probably um the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre okay and I, I had considered myself a horror fan at the time but Texas Chainsaw Massacre the original is something I watched under the worst conditions imaginable it was probably the fifth movie we had watched that night we were, you know, it was, everyone was tired. People were talking during the movie. It was on a, you know, tiny little TV. And I was just, like, absorbed the entire time. Yeah. It was just the most intense film-going experience ever. And that was probably the first one where I'm like, wow, this is a really, really good genre. Yeah. But, you know, since then, I, of course, love all of them. What about video games? Were you big into video games as a kid? Yes, obsessed. Yeah. 80s arcades, that's where I spent my Saturday <laughs> afternoon since horror films weren't available. Well, I, I know you told me years ago, um, and I don't know if you were bullshitting me or not, but I, you were in, like, intermediate school and you were submitting to Bally. Yes, the video game. Was. That, was that a true story? No, absolutely true. Okay, you, you need to tell this. I would, in probably fifth or sixth grade, I would 
draw out the graphics, design the gameplay, and you know it was all handwritten. Right. And I would send it off to Midway, and they would come back and say, you know, thank you so much. You know, this is how the next Pac-Man is going to be discovered, and here are a whole bunch of free posters and stuff. And I actually sent them one called Prodigy, and I didn't know what Prodigy meant. I was looking in the thesaurus for Monster, yeah. and I saw Prodigy, and so I thought, oh, that's going to be the name of the game, not realizing that Prodigy was not an appropriate name. <laughs> but I sent it off to them, and it actually was at the time would have been a pretty cool idea for a game it hadn't been done before it was your you flew around and you left a trail behind you and you had to circle around the monster and once you did a complete circle around it you it disappeared and you right. got points and they actually liked the idea and they came back and said um we need you to sign this form giving away all rights to the idea ever Holy unless shit. unless you seek a patent and at the time, you know, fifth or sixth grade, I didn't care if I got paid at all. I right. Like, My game could be in an arcade. I will rule the school. You would have too, I will man. I rule the school. And I signed the form, sent it off. And about six weeks later, they said, we're not going to pursue this idea. But Aww. I still remember the code. It was POI597 was their code. Holy for the, shit. So. so in sixth grade, you're, you're already getting an acceptance and... Well, also was, already getting fucked by the publisher. Yeah, yeah, exactly. so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah now, I was just obsessive, obsessive video game player. And I would still be to this day if I didn't know my limits. And I say, you know what? Just like an alcoholic won't keep alcohol in the house, I don't have video games in my house because I would never write another book. Would you ever write for video games, though? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I know we've got a lot of a lot of representatives at various companies out there that are listeners to the show. Yep, so you're I saying will. you're available. I'm available. Yeah, and if they want to make millions of dollars right. off your idea. And I've heard it's not as much fun as you would think it is. No, it's not. It's I've I've done it three times, and all three times, none of it ever came to fruition. It was an exercise in futility that paid the bills for a couple months. Yeah. I have a friend, Alice Henderson, who was saying she got to play test for LucasArts, you know, some of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. I'm like, that's the greatest job you could ever have. It's like, no, it's the worst job you could ever have. <laughs> there, any fun you think you're having from play testing video games is not accurate. Well, look at our, our good friend, Richard Dansky. I mean, yeah. he was a normal human being at one time, and then yeah, he went to he's work. he's just this hollow shell yeah. of a man. and it's all from video yeah, games. Yeah, it's very so. sad. We love you, Richard. Speaking of, of hollow shells, I know uh, early on you wanted to write screenplays rather than novels. Yeah. That was probably the worst segue ever. But um, when did you finally turn to prose, and what made you turn to prose? I was sort of bouncing between the two. I had done a dozen scripts, and I was marketing them heavily. The problem is that they weren't any good. So okay. you know, the stuff I was writing at 19 years old, I thought was brilliant. I thought this was you know Spielberg level cinema, and it wasn't. Right. It was, Strand level, nineteen years old cinema. Fuck that, man! And By sixth grade, you had Bally Midway up yeah. for you. <laughs> so what ultimately happened was I was sort of bouncing between the two, and once I sold my first novel you know, to the smallest press imaginable, right? Then I thought, well, I'll focus on what I know I can sell. And so, kind of the point I'm at now is, if I write a screenplay, maybe there's a point one percent chance something will happen with it you know i wrote a comic book script just for fun but i you know didn't really do anything with it right whereas if i write a novel if there's going to be a home for it right. maybe it's not going to be a huge home but i can do something with it i can make money off it so pretty much once i got a novel published and was in the system then i started focusing almost entirely on prose right I know, uh, you know, just like many of us, you started submitting and writing during that, you know, that mid to late 90s period when horror was supposedly dead. Um, I think your first world horror was 95. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. And uh, that was where you met Lynn, who would eventually, yes, of course, become your wife. And she's here in a room with us now. Lynn, can you, can you confirm it was 95? It was indeed 95. Yeah. Okay. It was 95, but there was no connection whatsoever. I barely, we didn't even remember each other. What happened was I had bought a magazine called Into the Darkness that right. had a story of hers in it. Right. And I read her story and I liked it and I sent her fan mail. My thought was because 
you know, this was, wasn't pre-internet, we were on a system called Genie, but it was before, it was at a time when you could be seriously writing and still not really understand how it worked. Right. My thought was, if you have a story published in a real magazine, you were getting fan mail all the time. <laughs> not realizing that when I sent her my piece of fan mail, she was dancing around the room, I got fan mail, I got fan was mail. Was that your first fan letter, Lynn? It was indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so that started, you know, emailing back and forth which eventually led to me moving to Florida. That is fucking cool. Yeah, it wasn't That's like awesome. we fell in love at World Horror. We fell in love after I sent her fan mail for yeah. the magazine I bought at World Horror. <laughs> that is fucking awesome. Um, now, we talked about you sold your first novel in the early, I guess, what? 2000. I sold it in 1999. Okay. Um, but you just went full time as a writer just a few weeks right. ago, right? Yes, uh, two weeks ago, right before I left for Nikon. So this is a—it's still the very early stages of, of being full time. What yeah. what has that been like? Is it scary? Is it daunting? It no, I've spent probably the past three years saying, you know, if I had those extra forty hours a week back, I'd be fine. I could make it happen. But you know. When we went through the leisure books thing, yeah, I remember thinking, "Wow, Brian Keene is in bad shape." Whereas oh, yes. I'm not counting on that money because you know, yeah. I got hit to my book Wolf Hunt, you know, got canceled right before it came out, and I'd never gotten paid for it. Right, it was this moment of, "Wow, what if I was counting on that money to buy food and yep. you know, pay bills and stuff?" So it's I having had that thing with a major one of my novels has always been kind of maybe this day job isn't that bad yeah you know you were you were the first of my friends to ever acknowledge that that i was in a bad fucking place when all that happened well you were yeah i mean you know, you know when you when your primary source of income is writing and you're not getting paid for that writing you know, you know, well yeah. yeah because uh delirium had gone down earlier that year too so there yeah. went both of my my main publishers yeah, it was you specifically know. thinking, wow, I don't want to be in Brian Keene's situation, yeah. so, you know, day job's not so bad. And then I finally hit a point where it's like, you know, it's I'm, it's dumb to waste that much time when I could be writing more books. Right. Now you And you, health care and everything's taken care of? Health care. Yeah. Right now I'm on Cobra, but, yeah, I'm going to have to be getting health care. There yeah. won't be a Kickstarter campaign after I get hit by a car. I, uh, so. when, I, when I had my heart attack, I had gotten my check for Ghoul. Um, the movie version, I guess maybe two weeks before, and I'd put it in the bank, and I was like, wow, it's nice to have money for once. And then I had my heart attack, no health insurance. Yeah. They're like, how will you be paying? And I said, do you take cash? Yes, we do. And there went there went my entire movie check. But at least I had it, you yeah. know? So, um, so now that you have, you know, all this time to, to write full time, I you know I would be remiss if I didn't ask this because the listeners are going to want to know. That means we're finally going to get another Andrew Mayhem novel, right? At some point, yes. At some point, you've been saying at some point for the last. Five well, years. it took it took seven years between the third and the fourth one, so it won't take seven years between the fourth and the fifth one. Yeah. Yes, there will be. Does that does that ever bug you? Um, I mean, you're you're working on what you want to work on, what your muse dictates, and people are just asking for another mayhem novel does, does there it is one you? specific situation where it bugs me when it comes right after you announce a new book oh yes when you say hey everyone here's the cover to my new book and when are you gonna read another Andrew mayhem novel oh yes give me 10 seconds to revel in the fact that I <laughs> have a new book out before we start asking for something different you are preaching to the choir yes. here. <laughs> otherwise you know if people come up to me at conventions and say we really want another Andrew mayhem book I'm that's wonderful I right. want people to be annoyed that it has taken so long to get to the next one just not right on top of a new book announcement yep that, that's all I ask. I, I agree I, I you I agree preach it preach yeah. it brother yes preach it See that that would have been a good point for the crowd to chime in, but you told me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> now you're you're primarily known for humorous horror, um, but you've also played it straight, and you know I argue that you've written some really truly scary and disturbing scenes. Um, it has always bothered me. I don't think you get recognized enough for that by critics. Do you agree with that, or am I am I full of shit? It kind of depends. I think actually. My, you know, my two quote-unquote really serious ones, Pressure and Dweller, I think they've gotten, you know, in some cases, more recognition than the funny stuff. It's kind of, 
I haven't ever been able to figure out specifically if the audience wants me to go comedy or go horror because I've got some people who say, you know, he's a very talented horror writer. Why is he wasting his time with the funny stuff? And then people who think, oh, you should be focusing on the funny stuff and not the horror. Do you so it, do you find yourself second guessing yourself when it comes to that? Like, not too much. No? I pretty much just, you know, I before pressure came out, I was second guessing the hell out of myself because I'm like, the audience is going to reject this. I have worked this hard to be the funny horror guy, and now I'm throwing a curveball, and this book is going to be hated by everyone. Right. And then it turned out to have been my most popular book at the time. Absolutely, so, yeah. So now I don't worry about it that much. I pretty much know that I can do a balance of stuff. I. You know, I don't know that I would do five real serious ones in a row. I would you know, right. like to mix it up. But. Did you get uh, you know, people buying pressure like that was their first introduction to your work? Because I remember Dorchester really pushed that book. Yeah. Um, and then they would go back to your backlist and find the funny stuff. Did that throw some people off? Yep. And yeah. it's thrown people off also who have started with the funny stuff and then picked up pressure thinking it's going to be this chuckle riot. Right. And, I guess it's like you watch a Stuart Gordon film and then watch something by Mike Lombardo. <laughs> so you can laugh at that part, Lombardo. And for the record, Pressure is a fucking excellent book. I love the hell. Thank you. There we there we go. Mike excellent. Lombardo says. <laughs> I, I hate everything, and I love that book. So. Now, in the same vein, you've you've collaborated with uh, James Moore, Con Jay Conrath, several others. Um, during the creative process and those collaborations, did you find that they were trying to be funny, like they were trying to, to meet some expectation they thought you had? Well, when I collaborated with Joe Conrath on Suckers, he was working for Hyperion, and he was writing big mystery novels, and he had a lot of restrictions on right. what he was writing. So with Suckers, he just went absolutely batshit on the humor. So it is just... Yeah. He wasn't trying to match me. He was just going nuts okay. because he had complete freedom. Yeah. Uh, Jim Moore, I think he wrote a funny scene. I said, hey, that's a funny scene. And he was like a three-year-old just giddy. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff thinks I wrote a funny scene. So, Like a flailing Sasquatch. Oh, no, we can't make that joke anymore because he, yeah, he's he cut, cut his, his hair. hair. And the source of his power is gone. <laughs> well, let's talk about Chomp. Um, now... When that was first announced, I know a lot of people erroneously thought it's a horror comedy directed by Lynn and Jeff must have written it. But in fact, you did not no, write I that movie. Not. Um, you were, however, an associate producer. I was associate producer, which basically distills down to did all the crap job. Yep. So if you watch Chomp and you think, wow, I bet that movie had great catering, or you <laughs> think, you know what, I bet the guy who did the clapboard did his job with just complete expertise or you look at the floor and you say hey there's no blood on the floor from a previous take so no one slipped and there were no insurance destroying accidents then give me the credit for chump yeah because i did lots and lots of low level tasks in that i hauled boxes i you know i but it was fun right it was, it was fun it is fun I've I've been an associate producer on some of Lombardo's that, films. Those and, jobs are the unsung hero jobs. Yeah, though. that stuff is absolutely necessary, and no one realizes it. But now Chomp has done really well. I mean, you know, it, it's done well on the circuit. You, you've gotten awards. Look at Lynn; she's beaming like I'm talking about her child. It's actually pretty awesome to see. Um, given its success and given the fact that you're now full time, do you think the two of you might collaborate on another film, and finally you can be a screenwriter? I don't think, I'm, as far as collaboration, Lynn, I sent her a bunch of my short stories for her to adapt. Right. But that was giving her creative control. That okay. was not a collaboration. That was, here are the stories, see what you can do with them, you get final say. As far as collaboration on another film, I think the next, she may be working on a feature, that's the plan at this point. Right. But that would be her writing it and her directing and me doing low-level type stuff again. Yeah. So... I think the dynamic in our marriage is she is the director, screenwriter, and I am the associate producer who hauls boxes. You stuff. know what? I think that works. It and works if it works, keep it that way. Don't yes. change it up. Lynn, would, would you concur? I, I do. Yeah? It's good that we don't collaborate because we like to stay married. Right. Well, I think that makes sense. All right. Well, uh, 
before we wrap things up here, I just I want to say again publicly, I know I've said it to you in private, but I apologize for stealing your book title. That's okay. Uh, the, the truth is I didn't steal it, and Jeff knows this, but since Jeff's fans are going to be listening to this episode, I did not steal his book title. Well, what's funny is I you announced your book pressure, and I thought, oh, I need to do a rising cover with your name crossed <laughs> out in mine. And that's as far as it was went for me. I yeah. you know, wasn't thinking, oh, he, that son of a bitch has stolen my title. But people keep bringing it up. Yep. But it comes off like I'm mad about it. I know, and I know and you're people not. Keep I know it's you idiots on the internet, but... Yeah, I, the, the way it happened is, is Macmillan came to me and said, uh, you know, we want you to write a horror novel, and here's the idea we have, and, and we want to call it Pressure. What do you think? And I said, I could do that, but we can't use Pressure. That's a Jeff Strand novel, and it's a fairly recent novel. And they said, well, we can give you this amount of money and call it Pressure, or we can give this amount of money to another author and call it Pressure. And so, you know, I love you, and, you know, you my boy and all, but... I needed the money. <laughs> I already had a book called Pressure. They could come to me. Exactly. So, but I, I did love your cover. And in fact, uh, with your permission, I think we may throw that up on uh, the Project I Radio website when this episode airs. Sure. All right, cool. Well, Jeff, where can folks find you online? www.jeffstrand.com. All right. And I appreciate you sitting down with us, man. And, and Lynn, thank you for, for sitting in. And the rest of our studio audience, Blasi, you can wake up now. Um, you can silence Lombardo as you do. And uh, All right, Dave, we're sending it back to you. This week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride. Hold tight, don't slide. That'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the psychopath that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Freddy Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely psychopath. Uh, or, um, psychopath. Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations, and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the psychopath. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. Okay, and our next guest is a poet and writer of horror, fantasy, and science fiction. She's not only a three-time Bram Stoker Award winner, four-time Bram Stoker Award winner, I'm being informed by Dave. Uh, I'm going to start over. She's not only a four-time Bram Stoker Award winner, but the first African-American to win the award. A founding member of the Sith Writing Group, her books include Animated Objects, Consumed, Reduced to Beautiful Gray Ashes, and How to Recognize a Demon has Become Your Friend. Her poetry and fiction have appeared in Asimov's, Essence, Doorways, Dark Matter, and received honorable mention in the year's best fantasy and horror. I am, of course, talking about the one and only Linda Addison. Can only be one. Hi. How are you doing, baby? Like one ring, there's only one Linda (laughs) Addison. (laughs) And and that one is almost too much to handle it sometimes. Well, could be, depending on your age. I I speak with some authority. (laughs) I've known you since uh, 2000, I guess. Like I said, I like to say I know Brian King before he was Brian King. But you knew me before (laughs) I was me. Yeah, it, uh, the World Horror Con was Denver that year, and oh you and, and I and some other folks, we stayed at uh, Tom Piccarelli and oh, Michelle yes. Scalise's house. Remember oh, that? Oh, boy. Fun times. Yeah, they, Good times. They lived next door to the, the Stanley Hotel, which was, of course, the, the inspiration for the Overlook. That's right. I still China. have the shot glasses I bought there. Yep. <laughs> and then you, you came to that party at my house in oh, 2000. My. You pulled up, opened the car door, and water came flooding out. Ooh, yeah, we kind of floated there. <laughs> you know, and you were you were at my wedding, my second wedding. It was awesome. This and, it was. and my dad still has a crush on you 15 and I years still later. got a warm place waiting for him in my heart. But not for me, not in for his heart. son. What's up with that? I told you. <laughs> <laughs> That's life thing, Brian. Come on. All right. And, and also, we're, we're both Pennsylvania natives. Um, yes. Now, you grew up in Philly. I um, did. You were the oldest of nine children. Was that a pretty tough childhood? Big time tough. 
Yeah. Yeah. Was in all the tough neighborhoods and not the best school system. I, I think the only reason I've even, you know, been able to seem intelligent is that I spent most of my childhood reading. Right. And reading does make a difference. Yeah. I love libraries. It was better than my home and my neighborhood. Were you reading speculative fiction early on? Or? Well, the, the thing is, like, I, I remember reading, remember when they were like the Yellow Book of Fables, the Blue Book of Fables? Oh, yeah. I read all the fables, fantasies, and then I moved on to science fiction and fantasy once I got older. Yeah. Now, what age did you want to start writing? Ah, there you go. This is interesting. When the first time I was in school, my early memory is holding a book, and it's the book, you know... Jack went up the hill. Right. And I remember holding it thinking, I want to make these. I want to I had no idea what the hell I was talking about. Yeah. I might as well said I wanted to make a unicorn. <laughs> I don't know. I was holding this thing in my hand with pictures and words thinking, I want to do this. I think there's more money in making a unicorn actually. No doubts. <laughs> no doubts at all. So that was my earliest vision and then being the oldest of nine and sometimes not always having electricity for TV and radio right because that was living the great American welfare story as dream as I like to say my job was to tell stories and entertain my brothers and sisters because my mom was always pregnant yeah <laughs> so just seemed like a natural thing to so make up stuff that's what you do you'd make up stuff and I sure did. gather around and listen mm -hmm. have you ever turned one of those into something as an adult I haven't. Back and I haven't. I think a lot of it was what would be, what would a 10 year old make up, like my own versions of uh, stories that I had read. Right. My own versions of fables. Although the closest is I did do Little Red in the Hood, <laughs> which was a takeoff right. of Little Red Riding Hood, which has actually done quite well for me. Right. I've published it in a Barnes and Noble collection, and but it's a very short, weird. Street version of Little Red <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So when when you actually started writing, I mean, did you aspire to do it as a career, or was it just no, man, something for personal poor. enjoyment? I, I grew up poor. I knew being an artist was poor. I wasn't gonna make that a choice. You had you had that presence of mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I had enough then. <laughs> that makes sense. I know you you started submitting Asimov's when you were in college. Way early. When I have the first twenty. Um, issues of Isaac Asimov's magazine. Right. And I had read all of his stuff. I met him um, when I, after college. But as soon as I wrote anything that was close to it, I just wanted to be in Isaac Asimov's magazine so bad. How many uh, rejection letters did you get? Fifteen years, baby. Fifteen years yeah. rejection. I sent everything that was even... Can you curse on your show? Oh, yeah. We say... Coop is a co-host. Okay. So. No <laughs> said. Um, I sent anything that was even close to seeming like science fiction. Yeah. No matter what that shit looked like. If it had anything in it, I sent it. And I was just getting form letters and form letters. And then I'd send it somewhere else and I'd, you know, I'd get stuff published. But it always went to Asimov's first. Yeah. And then um, how I got in? You know how I got well, in? Well, I, I remember it was uh, it was for the poem, How the Dinosaurs Died. But yeah, listeners don't know this story. So tell the story. So I went to New York as book country in New York. And I was talking to Frederick Poole. Right. And talking about writing science fiction and this, that, and the other. And he said, every science fiction writer has to write a How the Dinosaurs Died story. <laughs> and I was like... Bad. Okay, so I go home and I write this like 57 word story on how the dinosaurs <laughs> died. That's about as far as I can get. <laughs> and I was in a writer's group, which I still am, Sith, circles in the hair. Right. And I gave it to them and they were like, uh, Linda, this is not a story. This is like more of a poem. And I was like, okay, because I had been sending Asimov stories. Right. Just stories, not Just poems. Stories. So I, I turned it into a poem, took some words out, you know, did some indents, break, line breaks, right. sent it in, got accepted. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> and then I, and that was like my dream come true. And then I was in it for like four times and I was like, okay, now I want the New Yorker. Right. <laughs> but the, the key listeners out there had 15 years of rejections before she did that. Yep. So I know, you know, Obviously, then you took off. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, I was getting published in other places. Yeah. It's just that was my dream place, so everything went there first. I was with 
it, Carpe Noctum was that way with me. Mm. Um, 20 years later, I finally got a story in Carpe Noctum wow. this year. And Mikey Hike is the fiction editor. You would think at some <laughs> point he would have thrown one of his best friends mm. a bone, but no. It's all business when it comes down to business. Yes, I'm is. like that too. I can love you to death, but I'm sorry. If it, if it don't work, it don't work. We had Jack Herring on last week's show, or a couple weeks ago, I guess, and uh, you know he's now the president of the board of the Shirley Jackson Awards. Oh, you think maybe oh, maybe I'd be up for one, but no, that's not. We all we all just doing this like this. <laughs> all love until you write something that don't work, and then it's like whatever. But it's not always business. I mean, there are moments. You were the first African American to win the Bram Stoker Award. That was for consumed, reduced to beautiful gray ashes. Now, I mean, I, I know how. I know what I want to ask. I'm not sure how to phrase it. Um, really, you're gonna be you're gonna be polite with me? No, it's, it's not a matter. Of, it's not a matter. What happened? Of, Where did it go wrong? Not, Apparently, I'm, he's been drinking. I'm going to do things to you later that are illegal in this state. But <laughs> and I'm so over 21. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I mean, I'm you not know, sure why not, I'm here. Not only do you win, not only are you the first African American to win, but do you pause and think about? The historicness of that you it's always going to be referred to it's you know you yourself are going to be the first african-american what is that what does that specifically feel like well you know um i first of all when i first won to stoker besides being like blown out of my head because i was on the ballot with people that i admired right like i would go and see where Charlie Jacobs published, and that's where I said my stuff. You right. know what I'm so how did I beat her? I don't know, uh, and others. Um, I just found out afterwards. I looked on somebody's like, "Oh, you're the first black," and I was like, "No." Yeah. And then I look on the list. I'm like, "Oh." Oh yeah. Um, now in my 60s, and not that I'm old, but you know what I'm saying. Not I got old. more behind me than I got in front of me, and. There are moments where I think, what have I really left on this planet besides an awesome sun? Um, and then I think, wow, it's not bad. You left that. That's not I bad. I mean, that's you know, that's always going to be there. I know. I didn't mean it to Two, be. Two hundred years from now, that's still going to be there. And what's so interesting to me is that you know, horror is sort of the ghetto of writing in general, right? right. So. I don't really know how much of that is known, and then I'll go to some art thing in New York and my son and his friends will be there and one of his friends will come up to me and be like all adoring me and I'm like wow <laughs> you, you read you sure <laughs> are you sure it's just not because he thinks his, his friend's mom is hot well you know <laughs> that could be part of it too but <laughs> <laughs> my son says but his friends think I'm hot but they're also quite you know ad admiring of that yeah. app, so I guess it, it does it does mean something. That, well, I think it does. Absolutely. I think it means something. Um, your first signing for that book took place at Barnes & Noble at Rockefeller Center on September 11th. Um, I, I'd like you to talk about that day. I mean, were you reluctant to do the signing or were you um, just in shock at that point? The signing was set up before that September 11th meant anything. Right. And I was working a day job, which I'm not now. And I was in Rockefeller Center. I was working at AXA Financial. Right. I had the book sitting there against my cubicle. I was so excited because the signing was going to be in Rockefeller Center. Right. And then September 11 happened. Right. And the, the whole horror of that's like a whole two hour conversation. Well, exactly. I, I, when we've I put, talked about that. I'm not going to put you through that on the air. When I put the cover down, I put the book down. And I couldn't really look at it for a while. Yeah. The first poem is called Firefight. Right. Which you read that night, correct? I did. I didn't do. Oh, you did. You didn't do it. No, okay. the city shut down. All right. And the first time I read it was on a cable show a couple months later, and it was still shaking, and yeah. people were like outraged. And I'd written that poem two years before. Did they think you'd written it yeah. about September 11th? I was like, this is two years old. Yeah. But it was really startling. Yeah. It was a startling thing. That's a hell of a debut for sure. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I could have done the yeah. signing. I was so shook, but the city totally shut down. Yeah. I just about had to walk back to the Bronx. Yeah. 
Jeez. So I didn't even come back in the city for a week, and then there was the whole smell coming up from right. down there, and you know. Right. Well, your third collection, being full of light, insubstantial. Um, I don't know how deep you want to get into this, but I, I know that was inspired at least partially by your your mom's struggle with Alzheimer's. For sure. Um, do you want to talk about that at all? Well, I can talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Um, there, you know, we all search for meaning in life and how to handle things, you know. And up and, and I did Tai Chi, I do meditation. When the Alzheimer's hit with my mom, I was always trying to be very present with her. Right. And so for her, it got down to a point where she was like one sentence. Like by the time you got to the end of a sentence with her, it was gone. And so the concept of being present and now really became a real different thing for me. <laughs> and so I was writing that book. I wanted to write 100 poems because I, my other collections had been like 30 or 40 poems. So I was really intent on doing 100 poems. It was such a struggle. Right. Such a struggle, but I was determined. Yeah. Really pushing myself into the game. And you did it. I did. What What do you? And it won a Stoker. It did. It did. It did. The fourth. That was your third. fourth. Third. Was that your third? What yeah. was the fourth? Four elements. That's right. That's right. It's been a long weekend. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so what? I mean, what do you prefer writing, poetry or prose? Well, poetry is just like constantly going through my head all the time. Yeah. I'm looking at you, I'm talking to you, poetry is going through my You're writing a poem about me right now. I can now. write a poem about anything at any time. Yeah. I could be Harlan Ellison in the shop window writing. <laughs> I mean, I could just do it. So it, it's sort of genetically... I have to say, you're much better looking than Harlan Ellison. <laughs> I like his hair, though. I think it's pretty Is it real? Yes, it is, yeah. I've had my hand in okay. it. Okay, Harlan, I, I don't want you <laughs> suing us or threatening to sue us. It, it's a genuine question. Right. I just, and, Harlan, I'm, you know, the black girl with the dragon. I'm the one that's always playing with your hair. That's me. <laughs> Actually, Harlan, it's me. She's just taking the bullet for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so poetry's always in me. Yeah. And then stories started to occur, and now novels. I'm working on my first novel. That was my next question for you. What are you working on next? Are you ever going to do a full-length novel? Oh, so. I'm in the middle of beginning of science fiction novel series. No kidding. Yeah, shoot me now. <laughs> That's the title <laughs> or is that a request? <laughs> it's a request. <laughs> because I, there are days I wake up and go, why? Yeah. Why am I doing this? <laughs> I, I can do poetry well. What happened? Where did it go wrong? And it's just, I've avoided it for years because yeah. I was terrified. I thought I'd get lost in a book and never write. And so I did all this other stuff and, you know, did well. I've always over 300 things in print, and then I just had to do the novel. I couldn't. It, it would wake me up in the middle of the night, the characters, and yeah. I said, okay. So no poetry collections for a while. You've got to gotta go where the, where the muse dictates. And I can't, I can't tell you how this is going to work. Yeah. You were saying, like, how's the next poem poetry collection? I'd be like, ah, it's going to kick ass because I love my poetry. Yeah. I don't know how this is going to work. I'm I'm the same spot. I, I have a novel due at the the end of July called The Complex, and I haven't worked on it in two weeks. It's not finished, and I haven't worked on it in two weeks because my muse is demanding I write this novella that is is basically me working out my anger over the fact that two of my best friends have passed away in the last mm, six months. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And you know, I know you're right there with me, and, and sure we don't need to get into all that, uh, but. Yeah, you, you have to do what the muse dictates. And well, the thing is, Brian, you know you can write a novel. Well, exactly. I, on the other hand, I can't this write a is poem. An experiment. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Every all the writers I know are like, oh, you can do it. And then I was like, really? Well, how you know that? <laughs> I know you can do it. Would you like how to you know, know why? That? Yes. Would you like to know why? Um, first of all, let's take a look at your short fiction. Okay, the way it's plotted, the way it's structured. Okay, it's it's like little novel chapters. Each of your short, I predict that when you when this novel here starts to take shape, every chapter will read like a short story. Well, let me tell you a little bit about that. It's interesting that you say that. I when I won my third Stoker, I had a conversation with Rick Bartolo, right, and Joe Lansdale, the Kings. Oh yes. For some reason, the two kings sat me down in the corner <laughs> and were talking to me. And they were like, so, uh, Linda, thinking about doing anything longer? 
And I was like, oh yeah, novels, but I'm really scared. I'm scared. And Joe said, well, you do short stories just fine, and you just do each chapter like a short story, and literally, like someone snapped their finger, the fear left me. Yep. And that's how I'm writing this novel. That's all it takes, and that's why I know you can do this novel. The other thing is, you're fearless. You're fucking fearless. I mean, well, you were crazy. Yeah. You, yeah. Crazy well, I was. I was trying <laughs> to be polite, fearless. but. <laughs> I mean, you'll cut somebody, I'll no cut question. Somebody. So, yeah, I cut absolutely. I, well, not mine personally. Oh no, because you know how to act. Uh, <laughs> some people I may be in trouble. You <laughs> look no, out, man. I'm, jo- I'm joking. No, I know. No, no I, I have no doubt in my mind you can do this. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I agree with him. We'll I'm 100. Per- I'm in total agreement with what I, he's saying. I'm yeah. appreciative of the support. Let's see how this works. All right. Well, until then, where can folks find you online, Linda? Um, oh, my books are on Amazon in the Nook. Right, and that's Linda Addison, A D D I S O N. Correct, and my site is Linda Addison Poet, because Linda Addison was already owned by uh, a lawyer. Yeah, an attorney. <laughs> yes, and her and I are always coming up in each other's Google list. <laughs> Have you ever been contacted by her? No, no. but I think it would be hysterical. That would be funny. <laughs> All right. Well, Linda, thank you so much for sitting down with us, taking time. Um, I know it's been a long, crazy weekend here for us. Pleasure. Uh, you go get yourself some sleep. Yeah. And Dave, I'm going to let you uh, close up shop here. I'm going to make sure Linda makes it back to her room, okay? Okay, sure. Love you both. Love you more. My joy. <laughs> this week's show is brought to you by the following. Pinky swears and double dog dares. Spit in your hand and shake. Tonight we ride, hold tight, don't slide, that'd be your last mistake. Creposa Woods is a spooky dark place, even in the daytime. There are creepy crawlies and slithery slimies lurking behind every tree and under every rock, ready to reach out and snatch you away, never to be heard from again. Ghosts float in the misty fog that hangs in the air amid the branches. Some say serial killers and psychopaths bury their unsuspecting victims in shallow graves way far back from the psychopath that meanders through it, and the ghosts are all that remain. Are you scared yet, Freddy Cats? Cool, then grab your bikes and let's go for the ride of your lives. Meanderings of a dark and lonely psychopath, uh, or, um, psychopath, Randy D's third dark poetry collection can be found at all the normal book buying locations, and several copies are buried in the shallow grave way far back from the psychopath. That's if you're really dying to read it. Pick up your paperback copy or Kindle ebook copy and give this horror poem tome a good home. Horror fiction fans, brace yourselves for the double barrel horror volume two from Pint Bottle Press. The entire second series of chapbooks is now available in a single paperback anthology as well as for your Kindle device. Six talented authors bring you 12 twisted tales for twice the nightmares. Edited by Matthew Weber, this pulse-pounding anthology includes two stories each from John Bowden, Simon Dewar, Patrick Freivald, Chad Lutsky, Karen Runge, and M.B. Vuchasek. Shane D. Keene of Shotgun Logic writes, Like the dual blasts from a sawed-off shotgun, these 12 stories pack a brain-shedding wallop that kept me turning pages as fast as my fingers could tap the screen. Also available from Pint Bottle Press is the original Double Barrel Horror Collection, featuring six different authors, 12 hair-raising stories, and enough thrills and chills to choke a corpse. Pick up the Double Barrel Horror Anthologies at Amazon today, only $11.99 for paperback and $2.99 for Kindle, and find more horror fiction at pintbottlepress.com. If there's something you want to talk to us about, hit us up on Twitter, Facebook, or our website. Uh, the horror show is available not on iTunes. Well, let's hope that by the time you hear this, that it's resolved. Right. But it is available soon. on Android, Roku, Stitcher, Google Play Music, iHeartRadio, and all other platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. It's also available on the Project Entertainment Network's website. It's also available at the horror show with com. Go there. Click Show Archives, and you can listen to all 133 episodes of our nonsense. Most importantly, to advertise on the horror show, send an email to Dave. His email address is meteornotes, meteornotes at gmail.com, and Dave will hook you up. May I have your attention for the morning announcements? 
Please be advised to lunch ladies book club is coming to Project Entertainment Network. Join Shelley, Mimsy and Ashley as they dish out a deep review of a book. Horror. Thrillers. Whatever they want to read and review. A blonde, a brunette and a redhead walk into a bookstore and they're serving up hot book reviews. The Lunch Ladies Book Club, coming soon, exclusively on Project Entertainment Network. Would you now stand for the National Anthem? Don't get your lunch money stolen!